Hello, welcome back to Talking Europe on France 24. We are continuing our look into what 2019 is likely to hold for Europe with a man who's seen the EU from inside and out. Pierre Vimont is a senior fellow at Carnegie Europe following a four-decade high-level diplomatic career. He served as France's ambassador to the United States, ambassador to the EU. He was the first head of the European External Action Service and today he is one of the very few former diplomats to hold the title of, quite simply, Ambassador of France. Pierre Vimont, thank you very much for being our guest today. Many thanks for having me. Well, I'll be uh, looking forward to hearing what you th think about uh, European news, but I would like to start with something from right here in France. Our viewers have been following uh, the developments with the Gilets Jaunes movement. Uh, you know, we're seeing these Saturday marches and demonstrations continuing on into 2019. Uh, the French government in the coming days launching a period of national debate all around the country. Uh, do you think that they're starting to get a grip on this? It's uh, the national debate is precisely uh, done for that purpose, is um, how to bring this uh, social unrest and, uh, and this social movement into something that is uh, uh, more manageable from a political point mm. of view. And therefore, uh, taking uh, out of this movement uh, some of the main concerns, some of the political points uh, that the Gilets Jaunes, as you say, uh, want to, uh, the government to discuss and being able to move into practical action. Uh, I think the uh, national debate is a way of precisely channeling this anger into something that could be more positive and constructive. Now, you have publicly supported Emmanuel Macron, uh, notably during his election uh, campaign in 2017. Uh, but it does appear uh, from many voices in Europe that I've spoken to, at least, that Emmanuel Macron's image has been weakened by this episode with the Gilets Jaunes. Would you agree? I think his, um, his uh, European agenda uh, is uh, certainly being undermined to some extent by the, uh, by the Gilets Jaunes movement. But uh, from what the president has said in recent days in his uh, uh, different statements that he has made, he wants to stick to that agenda and he wants to move ahead. But what I think is, is maybe more interesting in, in uh, the remark you're saying, which is a very good one, is that how much nowadays the internal domestic politics of each of the member states is becoming part of a, of a larger mm. European political space where everybody is watching what's happening in the other member states. Mm. Well, quite right. I was going to bring in Italy, in fact, the Italian mm. leaders, mm. Matteo Salvini, Luigi Di Maio, uh, speaking out in support of the Gilets Jaunes, mm. having a, a little stab at France. Uh, the French Europe minister, Nathalie Loiseau, has more or less told them to mind their own business. Uh, do you see a provocation here from Italy? Is it real support for the Gilets Jaunes? Is it real provocation, a bit of both? I think there's a bit of uh, internal Italian politics also in, into this, and it's blunt uh, interference to some extent, which is why I think it's understandable that the French for uh, European Affairs Minister came in and, and showed a sort of... Uh, anger against, against this. Uh, but here again, I think what's interesting is that now every member state is following what's happening in the others. Mm. And, and look at the way in recent years, um, uh, all member states have been watching very closely how things uh, unfolded with the French presidential election, with the general elections in Germany, in Netherlands, in Sweden or elsewhere. Um, I think this shows that when we're talking about democratic deficits, in Europe, and um, no doubt it exists, and there is a lack of democracy at the moment in Europe. But one should also look at how slowly, progressively, uh, a certain form of European democracy is slowly moving um, into the uh, the European landscape, I would say, what coming form out from each of the member states. Mm. And I find this quite fascinating and quite interesting. Well, quite. I'm sure our viewers uh, will have noticed that uh, the Gilets Jaunes has become a movement uh, that sprung up in many different countries. We've right. even seen uh, pro-Brexit mm -hmm. supporters in the UK mm -hmm. taking on this European concept of a Gilets Jaunes, perhaps mm -hmm. ironically. Mm -hmm. um, does lead us on to Brexit. Uh, we've got the UK government looking unlikely at this point to get backing in Parliament mm. for the withdrawal agreement. Mm. Um, there have been some very public preparations as well for a possible no deal scenario. I'd like to get your thoughts on that in just a moment. But first, uh, let's check out this report on that story by Emerald Maxwell. 
This is what the UK government wants to avoid. Long lines of lorries clogging motorways in the event of a no-deal Brexit. But with the political impasse continuing and new custom checks at the border looking increasingly likely, it tested plans to ease the congestion that would arise. The purpose of this is really to try and make sure that we are not impacting the Kent Road network as much as possible. Dozens of lorries gathered at this disused airfield, which the government has plans to turn into a holding facility with space for 6,000 vehicles. That so as to prevent traffic chaos on the road leading to Dover, Britain's most important gateway to Europe. The trucks then drove the 30 kilometres to the port and back again. 150 were supposed to take part, but in the event there were only 87 lorries, with each driver paid just over 600 euros. So close to the 29th of March, when Britain is due to leave the EU, critics said the drill was a waste of money because it was too little too late. This trial is on far too small a scale. It's just about 100 lorries when about 10,000 lorries come to the channel ports every single day. It currently takes just two minutes for a truck to cross the border. Dover Port says that a mere two-minute addition would cause jams of more than 27 kilometres on both sides of the channel. Delays which could have a domino effect of economic repercussions. Coming back to our guest, Pierre Vimont, uh, as I said, Theresa May expected at the time of this recording not to get backing for the deal in Parliament. Jean-Claude Juncker, on the other hand, saying that there can't be a renegotiation of this deal. I know it's a big question, but where do you see this going? <laughs> Uh, very difficult to, uh, at the moment, to um, uh, foresee any uh, positive outcome out of this. I think for, for one reason, at least seen from outside of the UK, is that both political parties or main political parties are pretty much divided on this. The Conservatives and Labour. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Conservative on one side, Labour on the other side. And therefore, be it uh, the support for the uh, 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 agreement negotiated by the Prime Minister, be it the no deal, be it a new referendum, or even be it um, general elections, as some are talking about, about this possibility, you don't seem to have a majority uh, for either of these options. Mm. So maybe what we will witness in the, in the next few weeks ahead is a prime minister sticking to her um, uh, agreement, the agreement she had negotiated, maybe on the European side without going back and renegotiating the substance of it, at least maybe show through uh, a few statements a more positive and constructive mm. attitude towards Britain in order to show that we want to find a way out of this uh, gridlock where we are at the moment. We do hear voices in the UK, in the press, for example, saying the EU is bullying the UK uh, by insisting no re renegotiation uh, as someone seeing things more from the EU side. Uh, what do you make of that? We do have 27 member states on one side against just one. Yeah, I think it shows to some extent the total misunderstanding between <laughs> Great Britain and, and the Europeans. You know, what the European, the 27 member states are defending is what they have achieved for the last 60 or 70 years, namely the single market, the customs union. And what they think is more important than anything else, it's a level playing field. Um, and I think this, to some extent, hasn't been understood. And of course, as quite often in, in, in Britain, because this is part of the British instinct, they have blamed the French for <laughs> doing this. But, you know, listen to some of the most pro-British um, member states. Think about Netherlands, think about Sweden. They're exactly on the same line. Mm. When it is about defending uh, our achievements for the last years and the, um, uh, the uh, cohesiveness of the single market, where no, not one single member state is ready to move on this. All right, well, uh, Brexit uh, is due currently to happen at the end of March. Uh, at the end of May, we're due to have the European elections. Uh, so this is another massive uh, moment on the calendar for 2019. Uh, I think a lot of the talk at the moment is about where the political spectrum is going. It looks, according to polls, like the, f the far right end of the spectrum is going to do very well, perhaps the, the biggest or the second biggest political family in the next parliament. Uh, two questions, really. Do you think that that is going to happen, likely to happen. And also, if it does happen, then doesn't that just mean that a lot of voters agree with these parties and their concerns are not being met by the other groups? Right. Uh, I think one of the big unknown with this, um, uh, with this uh, European election 
is the uh, the turnout at the end of June. You know that usually mm -hmm. this is an election where people don't go and vote. Yeah, it's been just over forty percent the last exactly. two times. Yeah. Will it be different this time? It may be, but mm -hmm. it's still very difficult to find out how uh, voters will decide to go and vote. So this is a factor that needs to be taken into account. But taking it globally from, from over the whole of Europe, one striking element also in this uh, extreme right movement is that uh, there are many different political parties uh, which may differ and diverge on many important issues. Think about mm. migration, think about uh, uh, the relationship with Russia. We've just seen a meeting between Matteo Salvini and his uh, Polish counterparts. Mm. On many issues, they don't agree. Mm. And one could say the main thing with Austrian um, extreme right, uh, etc. So how far are these people ready to uh, gather together and create one single uh, political uh, group inside the mm. European Parliament? remains to be seen. Hungary, the um, Hungarian MPs, at the MEPs at the moment, are part of the uh, Christian Democrat political group. Uh, will they decide to leave or mm -hmm. not? Well, indeed, I wanted to ask you, perhaps just briefly, but about the Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban. Uh, he's faced censure within the EU with that uh, Article 7 proceedings uh, being launched with a parliament vote. He has actually since hardened his rhetoric, it appears, against uh, against the EU, against that censure motion, uh, into introduced more laws that are facing criticism, like the so-called slave law, the labour reform. Mm -hmm. um, to put it simply, what do you think Orban is doing here? Many other far-right members of the parliament see him as somewhat of a leader. Do you, th do you see him actually formalising that? He could be one of the leaders. He's not the only one. Um, if you uh, tell Mr Salvini that he should um, uh, sit behind Mr Orban, I'm not sure he would be uh, ready to do that. You would see a rivalry there. Yeah, perhaps. exactly. Mm. So I think it's a bit more complicated than mm. that. With regard to Hungary, I think... What needs to be done is exactly the same thing as what is happening with Poland today or with Romania. It's uh, when one of these countries is violating uh, European law, uh, European legislation, European principles, legal principles, this has to be put to the courts and mm -hmm. this has to be looked at in this very precise way. Does it not risk, however, sort of causing splits within the EU or, or worsening tensions, worsening relations? Yes, maybe to some extent it could uh, it could bring more acrimony uh, among, among member states. But look at what has happened, for instance, in Poland, with the uh, European Court of Justice has said very clearly and openly that the, uh, the current um, uh, judicial, uh, judiciary reform is not acceptable because it is violating law and the independence of mm. judges. Um, it's very interesting to see that the Polish, uh, Polish uh, government has decided to abide by that mm. ruling. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it will be very interesting to see how this will go on also with Romania and the whole thing about corruption. And I think the same thing has to apply with Hungary. And let's see how it works. Hmm. Well, you mentioned Romania there. Uh, Romania just taking over the rotating presidency of the Council of the European Union for the next six months, uh, a largely symbolic role. It does come with certain obligations for shepherding the EU agenda, mm -hmm. so to speak. It's also uh, brings us on to the topic of fake news. Uh, we follow fake news quite closely here on France 24. We've done a little fact check about a piece of news about Romania. Take a look. Is Romania getting extra powers over lawmaking and the EU's budget? This story comes from Russia Today's French website. The article is about Romania holding the presidency of the Council of the European Union for the first six months of 2019. The unnamed writer states that this means Romania gets to, I quote, decide, among other things, on new laws and budget changes at a European level. Well, this gives the impression that one single state, Romania, is getting disproportionate powers within the EU, and this is incorrect. In fact, the Council is just one link in a chain of decision-making. It's made up of the ministers of all the member states, and they jointly make decisions on specific areas. For example, the Environment Council is made up of environment ministers. In any case, new laws and budget decisions for the whole EU have to pass through a whole formalised process in the Parliament and the Commission first. As for the idea of the presidency favouring any one country, all member states take it in turns to hold the role for six months. The presidency holder can indeed put some of its own projects higher up on the agenda, but it doesn't have any more power over decision-making than any of its EU neighbours.
Just speaking about Romania itself as a country, there have been these demonstrations against government reforms. Uh, there's been criticism from Jean-Claude Juncker. Uh, but one MEP who we spoke to in Brussels pointed out Romania was a communist country just 30 years ago, uh, saying it's seen massive change within a generation, suggesting that perhaps the, Euro the rest of the European Union should go a little easier on Romania. Would you agree or has Romania signed up to be a member state and should step up to the plate? I think there's two two different aspects in your in your in your question. One is certainly um, we need to remain very firm with regard to principles and 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 and, and rules and values. Uh, we can't play with some of these values. But on the other side, let's be honest. Uh, since these country, Romania and all the Eastern and, and uh, European countries have have been brought inside and have become members of the European Union, there has been a lack of understanding between the two sides. Mm. Um, from the Western European countries, uh, they were somewhat dismissive with uh, Eastern and Central European countries, telling them just to follow suit and abide by what those f old members uh, wanted. This was old Europe. Mm. And um, for the new Europeans uh, who came in in 2004, there was to some extent a bit of misunderstanding about what uh, the European Union means. Mm. I think it's there are two things that needs to be done. Is that There needs to be more dialogue between the two sides. And secondly, they must show a little bit more solidarity from both sides. For me, this is what is missing at the moment, this ability to listen and to take into account the problems of the other and to try to to, to, to show more solidarity. Mm. All right, we'll have to see how the presidency pans out over the next six months. Thank you very much, Pierre Vimont, for being Thank our you. guest today. <laughs> Thank you for watching as well. Do stay tuned to France 24 for plenty more news, of course, from around Europe and from around the world. Versailles, the Louvre, Mont Saint Michel are well-known stars of French heritage. But French genius and France harbors many other hidden treasures. The arts, gastronomy, architecture, as well as nature's wonders. Come along with France 24. Discover France's living heritage. From young apprentices to accomplished craftsmen and farmers, to Michelin star sporting chefs, meet these people whose passion for their professions preserve and drive French heritage. You are here on France 24 and France24.com.